So, Iceborne has officially released on PC. Finally, after what feels like a bajillion years, it is awesome to have the PC brothers and sisters joining us in the fray, and uh, it's been kind of cool. Like, a lot of you guys have been talking about, like, jumping back in. Some of you guys may have been lapsed world players, and you're coming back for Iceborne, you're talking about how much you're enjoying some of the new stuff, discovering all the new mechanics and stuff. That is so cool to see. And in this video, I want to put together a few handy tips for those of you guys that are heading back into Iceborne. I know, I know Iceborne came out last week. Some of you guys will be like, this video's late. Listen, right, I was on holiday. I redid The Office. Look at this fancy space that I now have to record my videos from. Hope you guys like it. There's a Monster Hunter shelf over there. So, uh, yeah. That aside, I was on holiday. PC released towards the end of that. So we're talking about it today. Cool? All right, let's do it. The very first one is, of course, the uh, aptly named Yeet Tactics. Now, if you guys have been diving into Iceborne on PC, I'm sure you have discovered the Clutch Claw. It's fantastic, right? It's a super cool new addition. And of course, with that, not only do you get to uh, grapple onto the monster, basically whenever you please, there's also a whole lot of things you can do with that. And one of those is the thing that we typically call the Yeet, when you send a monster hurtling into a wall. Now, you'll know that, of course, if you jump on a monster, and you have a variety of different things you can do. You can climb onto it, and this will depend, of course, whatever your button mappings are, whether you're using a controller or the keyboard, but either way, you can either slap the monster with the clutch claw, which turns it to face different directions. Keep in mind that you can only do this three times. The fourth slap will basically enrage the monster, so that is, of course, a free enrage in the process. You can, of course, also perform your weapon-specific move. Now, if you're using one of the heavier weapons, that will weaken the monster straight away, Meanwhile, if you're using one of the lighter weapons, that will normally take two hits. Unless, of course, there's a couple of variations for that. We'll speak more about that later on. And also, you can fire out whatever equipped slinger ammo you have to send the monster running forward. Keep in mind, this typically has to be slinger ammo that you collect off the ground, be that dropped from the monster or from the environment. It won't work with things like knives and flash bombs, but in doing this, you can run them into obstacles. It knocks them down, creates a huge opening, and it's just in general a very useful thing to be doing. So if you guys are not doing that, you wanna make sure you clutch claw onto the monster, have some kind of slinger ammo equipped, make sure it is facing some sort of wall or an obstacle, or even better, another monster, and provided it's in the same proximity, then when you fire off the slinger ammo, it'll go hurtling into the wall, and of course it then creates a really nice opening. If you're hunting as a team, this is a chance for everyone to pile onto the monster and just do a great deal of damage, and if you happen to have weakened the monster in the process, then when it collides with an obstacle, it also does bonus damage to the weakened parts of the monster. There is of course a nice handy little extra tip for you. Keep in mind, when you put a monster to sleep, you can do the, uh, what we like to call the sleep and yeet, right? You know that waking up a monster that is sleeping does double damage. But of course, one thing that often happens is you wake up the monster and it then kind of gets enraged straight away. There is, however, a very tight window in which you can grapple with the monster and send it hurtling into an object before it actually gets back into that kind of enraged state. So if you wait for a monster to sleep, you perform your typical wake up attack to try and deal as much damage as possible. And you then have someone throw on a temporal mantle or a rock steady mantle, grapple straight onto the monster. And then of course, fire out their slinger ammo into ideally something that it's close to or some bombs you can then basically maximize that window because not only have you got the wake up hit, but you've also got a nice yeet to follow. So that is pretty handy. We did of course do a dedicated video on that. So if you guys want some more information, I'll link it down below, but principally that is what you need to know. Keep in mind, of course, if the monster is enraged, you won't be able to send it hurtling. So do keep an eye on that red eye on the minimap because if it's red, it's enraged and uh, you might as well save your sling ammo until it goes into the non-enraged state. Now, moving on from there to the second point, this one is kind of useful, especially for those of you guys that use light weapons. Now, as mentioned in the previous section, if you have a light weapon, typically, if you want to wound a monster, you need to perform your weapon-specific clutch claw attack twice. There is, however, an exception to this, and that is when you combine it with the clutch claw attacks. See, in order to wound a monster point, you basically need to inflict 100 points of damage from this clutch claw position. Now, if you're a heavy weapon, that does that in one hit. Meanwhile, if you're a light weapon, it does 50 per hit, hence the two hits. Each clutch claw slap, however, does 20 damage. So if you do some quick maths and you do three clutch claw hits plus a light weapon attack, you can actually do it the first time you mount the monster. Now, do of course keep in mind, there's a big kind of caveat to this. This will cause the monster to enrage, so it does of course remove your yeet window. Now, in terms of 
hierarchy in terms of priority, you should always send a monster hurtling into a wall before you consider doing this because that of course creates a much greater opening for your team. You don't want to suddenly go into a team hunt and start slapping the monster for the sake of it and then making it enraged because that just makes everyone's life a lot harder. However, in select situations, say for example the monster is already enraged and you want to weaken a particular part of it, you can jump on, you can slap it with the clutch claw three times, then perform the weapon specific attack and of course that will then weaken it the very first time you do it, as opposed to requiring you to jump on twice. Also, if you have, say, a build that focuses around Agitator and you actually want the monster to be enraged, this could, of course, also be another benefit for it because you can then, you know, easily get it enraged. Do you mind? Okay, so I've discovered there may be a problem with this new setup. What's up, buddy? Can I finish my video? Now, please don't sit on my laptop. Come on, no, 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 no. Anyway, as I was saying, assuming you have a build that potentially revolves around Agitator, then of course you're in a situation where you may want to make the monster enraged. This will be a lot more, say, if you're focusing on like a solo build, but either way, it's good to know that that's basically how the weakening mechanic works. So there are situations where if you're in a light weapon, you can avoid having to clutch claw on twice, and that may be pretty useful. And moving on from there to number three, how to disable unwanted items. Now, if you're looking through your inventory, you'll of course know there's two typical ways to go about doing it. You can either scroll through the traditional Monster Hunter item bar, or you can of course go through your radial menu. Now, one of the things worth noting is that if you're going through your item bar, sometimes you'll do this because you'll put your most important items in the radial menu, but there's not necessarily always the slots you want. So you then go to say the typical tray menu for like additional things, traps, other items like that. However, whenever you do that, you also have to scroll through items like the barbecue spit, the bug net, the fishing rod, things like that that you don't use that frequently. What you can do is if you go to the options and you go to item pouch, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can actually see where you can toggle the display for those items. Now, if you toggle it off, it'll actually make it so that those items never appear in that tray. However, the interesting thing is, because some of you might be thinking, well, that's kind of cool, but then what if there's an exceptional case where I really want my bug nets? If you map those items to the radial menu, you can still use them, but it means it keeps your tray clutter free. So basically, it's just a way to make it easier to access the items that you really care about. Next up, number four, do your steam works. This one is uh, kind of pretty obvious, right? But a lot of you guys will be focusing on loads of quests, you'll be playing through and you'll be blitzing through the campaign. And a lot of the time you may be neglecting this. And the steam works is incredibly important because at least once a week, if you do the steam works and you, you know, kind of max it out and go through to the point where it gets red and it explodes, you have a very good chance, almost like a guaranteed chance of getting a celestial print. Celestial prints, of course, an incredibly useful resource because you can trade those for important monster items like mantles or gems or things like that. So if you're trying to sort of craft something you need, like, like pesky, I don't know, Zenoga Sky Emerald or something like that, you can then trade Celestial Prints for those. So I would recommend at least on a weekly basis trying to clear it out because when you're playing through things to begin with and you're maxing out your quests, you'll often be sitting on thousands of like fuel resource for this and it's very easy to just to kind of go through and just blitz that one in one. Keep in mind if you're using a controller you can hold down right trigger and it does it automatically. There doesn't appear to be any like discernible difference between pressing the buttons manually and holding the random button because it still seems to be random. So honestly a lot of the time once I've kind of done a week's worth of quests and I've got a load of things banked up I will actually just wrap an elastic band around my right trigger and just let it do its own thing, and you then come back later and you get your free Celestial Prints. But definitely do it, don't neglect it, because Steamworks is gonna be a big ally for you later. Moving on from there to number five, eat for feline safeguard. Now, if you guys play Monster Hunter World, you'll of course know feline insurance is a food skill that you can use to negate one of your carts or the very first cart. So basically, if you happen to be going into like a tough quest and you aren't too confident with it and you eat for feline insurance, it basically gives you one more cart. Well, in Monster Hunter World Iceborne, they introduced feline safeguard, which is basically the same sort of thing. This is a team-wide version. So if you eat for it, the very first death on your team doesn't count. And the cool thing about this one is that it does actually stack with feline insurance. So if you are in a fortunate position where say, in your instance, someone's able to eat for insurance, someone's able to eat for safeguard, you technically speaking, get two additional cocks. Now, obviously you're not necessarily always gonna need that. And if you're going out more efficiently, you're probably gonna wanna eat for those like damage boosting skills. But if you are going into something that you're not very confident with, maybe you're, you know, doing the final boss or doing like later on when it gets added, things like Safi Jeeva, and you're like, ah, I don't know if this is gonna go too well, then just eat for one of those. And you can basically just give yourself a couple more cocks. Also keep in mind if you happen to be playing through in like, 
a duo or even solo, then you can also improve your Palico gadgets because if you increase the uh, Vigor Wasp one, simply do that by just using it on your quests, then it also has the ability to revive you for the first time when you die. So technically, if you're playing in a double and someone ate for insurance, someone ate for safeguard, and you had the Palico gadget, you could technically get three cots. Moving on from there to number six, using the Guidance Lands to level up. Once you get through the campaign, you get to the end and you want to start boosting your master rank, you get to the point where, much like you did in World, there will be various different master rank gates that you need to get through in order to encounter the next level of quests. And eventually you're going to want to do this if you want to fight things like Gold Rathian, Silver Rathalos, Ruin and Ogigante. And one of the easiest ways to level up is simply to go into the Guiding Lands. The Guiding Lands is a great place anyway. You're going to be going there because you're going to want to farm monster materials that you'll use later on for augments. But if you go in and you hunt monsters in there and you then report and you hand that back in, that is actually a really good way to boost your master rank bar. It's one of the sort of easiest and fastest ways to do it, especially if you get a team of people together. You can just sit in the Guiding Lands for an extended period of time, hunt things back to back. I tend to prefer kind of going back and reporting each time. And I think there is kind of like a threshold where if you hunt too many things, it might back up. Either way, point is, you want to level up fast, go into the Guiding Lands, it's kind of like a win-win situation because you get the materials you'll need and you're leveling up in the process. And then finally, if you're looking for people to play with, number seven, cheeky one, but don't forget to join the Aris Gaming Discord because we've got plenty of Monster Hunter channels over there and we've got channels for different platforms, we've got PlayStation channels, Xbox channels and PC channels, so if you're looking for people to play with, you're struggling on a quest and you can't find someone, then jump in the Discord, the link is down below and you can jump in and join people. So yeah, that's kind of useful. Anyway, that's it for the time being. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. Hopefully you found it useful. If you guys have got any additional tips for any of the kind of new PC players, by all means, drop them in the comments down below. And be sure to keep it locked. We've got plenty more cool stuff coming your way. In fact, the Celestial event is supposed to be dropping pretty soon. I believe it's next week, thanks to the uh, updates from the Japanese Twitter account. So uh, lots of cool stuff to look forward to. I really hope you guys enjoyed that video. Remember to hit that subscribe button and also click on the little bell icon to turn on notifications so you don't miss my next upload. Also don't forget, you can check out 269 and Paradise Central streaming over on Twitch six days a week. You can find a link to the multi-stream in the description box down below. Be sure to drop by and get involved. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy. Catch you next time. Peace out.